Welcome to the Art and Science of Complex Sales. This is a podcast where we explore how the best B2B sales leaders make the complex simple, drive relationships and revenue, and generally elevate the sales profession. In this podcast, we're bringing together sales experts, thought leaders, top account executives, buyers, industry insiders, all to share their experiences and best practices for navigating the complex sales cycle. So whether you're a seasoned sales professional, a sales leader, or just starting out, you're going to find practical insights and actionable advice that you can apply to your own sales journey. Plus, we have a bit of fun. Today, we welcome Mike Simmons. A revenue and leadership coach, Mike helps leaders break through the challenge of second-guessing their work, creating clarity, and driving fearless decision-making. An expert in leadership coaching, revenue enablement, and leadership operating systems, Mike's approach is driven to achieve results. We hear today the depth to which Mike brings a systematic mind to creative problems as he challenges our perceptions of how we can achieve breakthrough. I'm excited today to have a true catalyst, Mike Simmons, on the program. Let's get rolling. Mr. Mike Simmons, how the heck are you? I am doing absolutely awesome, Paul. How are you doing? Uh, fantastic. I, uh, I get to talk to you. I'm a happy man. <laughs> what could be better? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Tell me a little bit about uh, Mike Simmons. Where are you in the world today? I am in uh, the great state of Arizona. I live in Gilbert, which I affectionately refer to as North Tucson, which isn't too far from where you went to school. And uh, that's where I am today. What else do you want to know? Well, bear down, right? Uh, no. <laughs> Works up. And uh, we might end this conversation like right now. Damn it. Damn it. Yeah. At some point, I am going to get. So, truth be told, I'm an alumni, University of Arizona. Mike, you're an alumni of. Arizona State University. Arizona State University. So we have a natural animosity, but we come together on the subject of sales and customers and actually have a lot of fun together. So tell me a little bit about how Mike, Mike Simmons defines sales. Yeah. Sales is about uh, connecting the dots between a problem and a solution. Now, the challenge we run into is some problems are known some are unknown. You know, we've got situations where people are problem unaware, and then all of a sudden they become problem aware. And on the solution side, some solutions are known and some are unknown. And I don't need to go all like Donald Rumsfeld about known knowns, known unknowns, and unknown unknowns, although I just did. You just There's did. this. We've got known problems and unknown problems. We've got known solutions and unknown solutions. And if we can connect the dots between the problem and the solution, we can actually help people solve problems faster. So sales at its core is about problem solving. It's problem solving at its core. And that's why I believe everybody could benefit from basic sales skills and perspective. So problem solving at its core. Well, are you like me that I think everything can be put into a four box at its heart? Like I've got one over my over the corner of my shoulder. Like yeah. yes, yeah. It's amazing what you can do with an X and a Y axis, and then yeah. and if you get really creative, you could you could throw a Z in there, and now we've got you know, three dimensions. Yeah, it it can things can absolutely fall into a two by two. What's your favorite two by two? My favorite two by two is the first one I learned. Actually, it was uh, Covey's. Uh, yeah. The important on one axis and the urgent on the other axis. And I use it all. I still use it all the time. Like I'll, I'll start to, gosh, I'm, I'm living in this quadrant. I'm living in quadrant three. Oh my God. This is terrible. Too much urgent, but it makes life easy, right? What's yours? What's your favorite? So I'm going to use this in, in, to share my favorite quote. Uh, and there's a couple of them. And some people don't like me quoting Marie Antoinette, but whatever. Uh, there's nothing new except what has been forgotten. And Covey actually stole that or borrowed it from Eisenhower. Really? The Eisenhower, yeah, the Eisenhower matrix. And Eisenhower used it as a way to decide. He would look at things, and we, at least the way that he shared it was, do I do it? Do I decide whether or not I want to do it? Do I delegate it or do I kill it? Do I eliminate it? And uh, so Covey reintroduced it to everybody under with one axis of importance, the other one is urgency. And it becomes a really, really powerful way to look at decisions that you make around where you're spending time through two dimensions. And that's the value of a two by two. My favorite two by two is the one I've got over my shoulder, which is one I developed. And the one and this one is around energy and impact. We all find ourselves in meetings, I'm sure, doing 
doing work that sucks the life out of you. Mm -hmm. So on one side of the X axis, we have energy and negative energy sucks the life out of me. On the other side, we've got po uh, positive. It brings me energy, gives me life. And then on the Y axis, it's impact, low impact, high impact. Ideally, I'm doing things that are high energy, high impact. The cool thing about something like this is you can find people who get a lot of energy out of things. Like I get no energy out of watching that team from Tucson play football. Yes. You do. Okay. So yeah. we have these, this inverse relationship where if I can find someone like you who gets energy out of spreadsheets, financial statements, working through all of the operational details, then we can create some really cool magic together because you're doing some really high, ener high energy things that are high impact on the world. I'm doing things that are high energy for me that are high impact on the world. Yours suck the life out of me. Mine might suck the life out of you. And if we come together, it's like a giant Reese's peanut butter cup. And what could be better than a Reese's peanut butter cup? Reese's peanut butter cup with milk. There you go. Be, See? There you go. So you add the third. Level it up. Let's yeah, put no. some ice cream in there. Oh my God. Yeah. Um, See? It's it becomes the blizzard, right? So you have there you, go. you have a dairy, we just did the Dairy Queen blizzard. No, I love that. We I used a lot of, of things in terms of like strength finders and other things, yeah. but they all really are built on that two by two, right? Yes. They're built on that ability to match that up. So tell me how you do that. Let's put that in the context of selling. And if yeah. if you're working with working with reps, how does your two by two, the energy and impact, help people sell, help drive impact? Yeah, so it's a, in that instance, it's about finding meaningful work. Like, what's the mm -hmm. work that you're meant to do? If you're doing high energy stuff that's low impact, that's okay. It's a good way to refill, you know, fill your cup and get yourself some energy and kind of recover from some negative stuff, whatever it is. It's okay to do that stuff. If you can find the high energy stuff, the stuff that fills you up and has high impact, that's where the, that's where the magic tends to happen. If you find yourself doing a lot of work that is low energy, sucks the life out of you, internal meetings, then you've got to figure out a way to get out of that situation, eliminate that and do the more high energy stuff. So one of my, quick fixes or tricks or whatever. And I'm not a big quick fix or trick person, but if you're constantly getting called into internal meetings that you do not like being a part of, just happen to have client meetings scheduled over those. The client comes first. <laughs> so let's go. And as any good sales leader knows, you've got to, you, you want your people out there generating revenue. And if they're not in meetings, if they're not meeting with clients, they're doing things that are not necessarily, well, if they're in meetings with you internally, they're doing things that aren't necessarily going to generate revenue. So it becomes just a really quick test to say, hey, am I doing the right work? Am I doing work that's impactful? Is it, am I doing work that's meaningful? The other way that I use this is, you know, think about it. We talked about problems that are known or unknown, solutions that are mm -hmm. known or unknown. You could do the same thing. So we could have problem on one axis, solution on the other axis. Is the problem unknown and the solution unknown? <sighs> Watch out. You've got to do heavily invest in early stage zero to one sales. There's a lot of work that you have to do to help people get become problem aware and then solution aware. If the solution or the problem is broadly known, people, everybody knows that they've got the problem. They're looking for answers. Well, maybe marketing is a little bit better. We could start to leverage things like SEO and take advantage of some of the searches and where we're putting content out there. So if, when we look at the problems that we're solving for in the marketplace and the solutions that we have in the marketplace, we can put it up against a two by two like that and start to say, where do we want to put time, energy, and impact? So that's another way that I apply it. And then the third way that I apply, and this comes from another two by two, which is a Dan John, Dan John introduced it to me, you know, coach University of Utah, football coach, Olympic uh, discus throwing coach. He has a process outcome matrix. And the way that he looks at this is, uh, can it be improved? Yes or no. Mm -hmm. Is it needed to win? Yes or no? Imagine if you looked inside your organization, and you said, of the skills that we're working on, can mm -hmm. they be improved? Yes or no? Can this number be improved? Yes or no? That's one view. Because if it can't be improved, why are we spending a lot of time, energy, and resource on it? Is it needed to win? Yes or no? If it's not needed to win, again, why are we spending a lot of time, energy, and resource? And for those who've met me in person, you know that I will never be a seven foot forward in the NBA. My height cannot be improved. It is needed to win. I am not the right fit for the NBA. Mm -hmm. 
So those are a couple of ways they do it. And what ends up happening is you get that smile like you just did, the reaction. People start to say, holy crap, what we're actually doing is simplifying decision-making. And my response is, yep, that's what we're doing. We're doing it through providing an additional perspective. We're not just making a decision based on one point of data. We're adding a second dimension to go in there and start to say, how can we de-risk this and move things forward? What you, and what you're outlining right now is, and I'm going to take it back to your original definition, right? You, you are outlining problem solving tools and you are giving people, I mean, that's how we're relating, right? Relating this to sales. You are outlining problem solving and tools, which ultimately are getting you to those ahas of these are the things we need to tackle. These aren't the things. It really comes together for me why you define it like that, right? Because you are. If you have a mission, if you have a mission to understand, then the more I learn about, the more I learn about Mike, this, this mission for logic and the mission for understanding and to get all the pieces, parts, and then put together the puzzle is a big one. You treat a lot of life that way. Am I right? Everything. How you, I, Camille Clemens is a friend and she's the first person who I've heard say this. So I attribute it to her. And I know others say it, so it's probably, again, it's like the Marie Antoinette thing. You know, there's nothing new except what has been forgotten. Uh, how you do anything is how you do everything. And I, there's not a distinction between me here talking about this, me here talking with clients, me here working with my family. Now, my family doesn't like that they feel like they get treated like clients, but it's how I treat everybody. <laughs> it's, that's, that's it. And mm-hmm. I actually look at this as a decision-making tool. And I think there's a big difference between decision-making tools like this and a problem-solving tool. And I have one of those okay. too. Yeah, so, there, so the problem-solving tool that I use, spoiler alert, it looks ju- it's an account planning framework. This is how I developed it and deployed it inside organizations. I just call it a problem solving tool because there are some people who do not like salespeople. They do not like sales tools. And this is my Jedi mind trick. So problem solving tool, it's a hexagon. Okay. And you'll see this a lot in both Whiteboard Wednesday videos and some of the other stuff I share out there. At the top of the hexagon, it's what problem are we solving for? What's the problem? Number one question, what problem are we solving for? We have to align with the people that we're working with around what the specific problem is. Because if we don't know what the problem is, if we don't have a definition, then, then how have we earned the right to get to the next question? The next question when working with others is who? Who has the problem? Who's impacted by the problem? Who cares about those who have or are impacted by the problem? And again, we're looking at a hexagon. So top piece, what next line to the, I think, right would be Mm -hmm. what would be who those three people. And then we're going to jump over to the other side and we're going to talk about why. Why does the problem persist? Why is it important to solve? What's the actual business impact of solving the problem? What, who, why? The who people, you got to get those in there because you need ever be other people's perspective and you need to understand like, what's their view of it. It helps to clarify some of the definition piece. It helps to clarify an understanding of why, uh, why it's important to solve. You think of um, an end user who has the problem inside the organization, the leader who is in or leader or clients who are impacted by their, them having the problem and the people who care might be board and customers or something to that, something to that effect. But there's three mm-hmm. different personas or different people. And I don't like personas. I think personas are crap. Personas are fictional beings. Fictional beings do not have problems. They have manufactured problems, but that's another story to get into at some other point. So going through what, who, why, only then have we earned the right to get into how and how often do we find ourselves in those situations where someone's like, I've got a problem, I've got this nail, and someone comes up with a hammer, I've got a hammer, and we're going to go jump into solution right away? That three pieces at the top of the hexagon, if you draw a little kind of some arcs underneath it, it starts, mm-hmm. it looks like an umbrella. It's my Mary Poppins approach to problem solving. What, who, why, then we earn the right to get into how. Once we've identified how they've attempted to solve it before, or how we've attempted, how we mm-hmm. might solve it differently, then we can get into things like when, which is the other side of the hexagon. And then the bottom piece is what's our plan? Short term, medium term, long term, 30, 60, 90. What's our, what's our actual project plan so we can um, define next logical steps, start taking them and hold people accountable to it. So now we've got six sides. We've got a hexagon as we work through this. And you can see the images on just about anything that I share. You know, they're out there. 
You're going to, you're going to be, uh, I'm taking notes and you're going to laugh at this. I'm yeah. sorry I interrupted, but I drew, I drew a Pentagon and I completely <laughs> lost the plan, the 306090. Yeah. I screwed so, myself. So, yeah. So, I, so I've got another, another one for that. And, uh, the, and uh, like all these kind of models, like I, if you were looking for a model, you now all have a guy. <laughs> like there's, yeah. there's a model that I've either adopted from somebody else or, you know, because there's some really great models that are out there or ones mm. that I've created to help simplify execution, which is a core focus of mine. How do we simplify our, our ability to achieve results but so you missed you missed the piece so you didn't get the plan in there and the challenge without having the plan is you know how do we actually start doing the work how do we know what work to do what order we're going to do it and how do we hold ourselves accountable and the organization and the people accountable to doing things in the context of either 30 60 90 traditional quarterly planning three months six month nine month looking kind of out at toward an, a year or in a crisis situation next 30 seconds, 60 seconds, 90 seconds, short-term, medium-term, long-term. Because if we don't get from A to B, we're not going to get to Z. Like We've got we've to start working through it. But the, so when you've got this hexagon up there, the other thing you can do is you can look at it and say, where are my gaps? What questions have I, do I not have full information on? So think of your account plan. Where, are, where am I missing some things? What who's have I not gotten into? Do I really understand business impact? Why? how they look at value, how this is going to change things that are happening in the business. If you look at that hexagon and any of those lines are dotted, meaning I, I have incomplete information, that shape can't hold water. You now see where your risk is. You've got to solidify those lines, shore them up, and then feel comfortable moving forward. The one thing that is that did not happen in any of those questions, other than we, when we got into the plan, none of those things are time bound. So some people will argue and say, well, it takes too long to put this together. I've got, to, I've got transactional sales. I need to do this. I can do this in the context of picking up a burger at in and out burger. It's, it, it, this is not, these things aren't time bound. It's, it's information. It's data bound. And it's all about mitigating risk. It's all about perspective, uh, asking questions to shift that perspective. I, I love it because I think I think a good sales methodology and, and here I'll I'll go into something I'm passionate about. I think a good sales methodology you need you need to be able to carry out in both of the the context of a single conversation or a single interaction, right? Yep. And then it needs to also be able to build to a build to an overall uh, plan. So I love that because you can you can have that conversation and you can understand it. You can understand the the core of this stuff. Just through asking questions and yep. like you said, in an out burger, right? You can it, it can be what you choose to order, but you can also expand that to being a full on six month six month sales cycle that yeah. that we're diving into each of these things and doing yep. them with with excellence. I, you're the, one of the first people that has said, "Well, there's a difference between this problem solving process and this decision making rubric." Right. So tell me about that, because I'm fascinated about that. I think that's really it'll be really impactful for the people that are listening. Well, there there are two different processes, right? Like if problem solving was all about decision making and just making quick decisions, we'd be in an awesome place. We wouldn't find ourselves caught in this spaghetti of chaos and completely lacking clarity. But that's not the case. We've got a lot of people mm -hmm. who are who are stuck in chaos. So if we're if if we agree that we're stuck in chaos, well, how do we deconstruct and demystify and and simplify that chaos? Well, let's figure out the specific problems that we're looking to solve, and then from there, let's start to put ourselves in a better position to make some decisions. So decision making framework beyond the two by two. Uh, another one that I use is one that ties to a proposal planning. And again, all of these are models that I've built out over like career. This is life work type stuff. This is not, this is not, Hey, you know, I got yeah. knocked in the head with, and now my flux capacitor is here and now, and, and we're going to go out and test it and see if we can see what happens when we go 88. Um, but there's a, there's just two distinct processes. So one of the keynotes that I'll do is around simplifying problem solving and decision making. That mm -hmm. is completely separate from simplifying go to market or simplifying achieving results or simplifying communication. 
You don't want to do all of those together because you're not going to simplify anything. You're going to create a lot of complexity. So where it comes from is there's just different jobs to be done. The job to be done in the problem solving tool is to really make sure that we actually have context and understand it. Um, we can use that tool and I will use that tool as a qualification checklist. So in our, in what we started about talking about sales methods and stages and built, where does this fit in the sales cycle in qualification? I, in order to be qualified as an opportunity, I've got for me, it's I've got to understand the problem that we're solving for in the context of the client's language. If I don't have that, then we're not going to be able to exit that exit that stage. And there's more detail depending on length of sales cycle. Shorter sales cycle, you might be able to go through your entire qualification checklist. Longer one, it's going to take a while and it's going to take multiple meetings. But yeah, my distinction between the two is because they're two fundamentally different practices. One, we're making a decision. The other one, we're kind of working through to make sure that we're even focusing our time, energy, and attention on the right thing, on something that's thing. important. Yeah. Well, and I see it in the in the context of both selling and buying, right? So, yeah. and I, I also see it in the context of you, you look at a lot of organizations and, and we've probably both seen this in our career, but a lot of organizations believe that the that all you need is is the process, right? Or all all as you need is that that problem identification process that your your salespeople are going to do again and again and again. And if you do that enough times, you're going to have you're going to have outcomes at a specific percent. But if if you don't give them that problem identification process plus the and again, why I love the way that you frame this plus those tools to enable the decisions to enable the decisions in your favor and also to enable people to help people make decisions, right? Because a lot of sales reps, they'll say, I went through the process. I went through the process. I filled out the box. I did this. I did this. I, did. I still didn't. What? I even, I even had a decision matrix. Well, that's a part of your process. So what have you done to actually enable and help them take that leap, right? Decision, <laughs> you know, decapitate. They both start that. There, it's, there is a break that somebody makes that decision. And yes. how do you help them do that as a part of this methodology? Like, so yeah, does that make sense to you? Yeah, it, it, do, it does. And I'm going to, another, I'm going to, I'm going to make fun of you probably because of your education, but That's, um, I, you know, bear down. Sorry. So uh, methodology, ology, study mm -hmm. of methods. This is not a methodology. It is a method. It is not the study of a method. <laughs> it, is, it, is a it is a method. method. And so like you have sales methods that you apply. You don't have sales methodologies. And someone will beat me up because of my Arizona State University education and why that's incorrect or incorrect. But I, as we go, as we go, as we, as we, as we, as we go through it, and we're having, we're having fun with each other. I, yes. There's another tool that you can use here. And it's a decision made investment decision making tool. It also is what I'll coach people on relative to making sure that we've done our homework relative to delivering a proposal. So the proposal framework in the context of, of sales, putting a proposal together, every proposal that you have, people don't care about your company. What problem are you solving for? Why is it important to solve for in the context of that organization? Business impact. Maybe include something related to persist, but what's the problem? Here's the problem we're solving. We've identified our understanding, why it's ha having this impact, it's impacting revenue, it's impacting resources, it's impacting growth, it's impacting whatever. At the bottom of the square, how, so what at the top, why on the left side, how on the bottom, how we're actually going to solve, and then cost on the other side. Investment resources. Time is a cost. It's a resource. Money is a cost. It's a resource. People or costs, the resources. What time, energy, and resources are we going to put into it? If we can't answer those four key questions in the context of what's important to the customer, the likelihood of our proposal getting improved decreases significantly. This is why in like the catalyst sale method, sales process there, when a proposal is delivered, we would forecast that at 90%. Because we've done all of this work before, we've validated, we've qualified, we've We've identified, confirmed, we've got fit established from our perspective. We've confirmed fit on the other side. And when you look at your sales process, it's kind of like shoots and ladders. 
you know, if you play the board game, you know, you can you get somebody who's really excited and they want a proposal. So you jump ahead and you climb up the ladder and then you've run into procurement and you go down the slide and you go right backwards. So in addition to this kind of stuff, I'll use board games for, to help simplify the way that we look at this stuff. So getting back to the rep at the rep level, it's more about, okay, in a coaching capacity, how are you thinking about this? What information are we missing? If you were in the customer's shoes, how would they go through the process of making that decision? That investment, that proposal plan from a customer perspective, that's an investment decision making plan. They should be looking at those same things. And a lot of times they don't. Like a lot of times we run into customers who they think they understand the problem that they're solving for and why it's important from a business reason, but the why is more focused on them as an individual, not the constituents that they're supporting inside the organization. And this is where we as sales leaders, as sales professionals can help guide our customers. So I use tools like this to help with simple questions, to help get an understanding of how people are thinking about this, and then coach based on how I see them do. And then once they start seeing the work work and it become it then see the simple nature of the kind of going back to basics hitting on the fundamentals then they start to embrace it more the biggest challenge is when leaders inside the organization try to accelerate the process because we're at end of quarter or we're at end of year and we've got to figure out a way to get the number in and you try to skip steps and a lot of times you skip steps without context and you take on risk you try to jump from validation to proposal or qualification to propose qualified to proposal and those steps that you skip as a leader and you force your team to do all they do is they create more damage downstream i don't know if i nailed the question but that's what came to mind as we were as we were talking through that paul no it was i, I think it was great it brings a we're having a conversation i think it nailed the question i also think it brought up another one for me which is so that is an impact that that is an issue it it is a major issue in sales today yes. and i think and probably for a long time of sales it's uh, but i only exist i've only existed in it for the past 20 years so it's been an issue for the past 20 years how do you help sales leaders how do we coach sales leaders to to fix that that's a big deal right huge deal. and that end of quarter that end of year that end of whatever pressure i hate it quite frankly. Yeah. And, uh, but it comes and it comes in a variety of ways and it comes in a variety of ways for the way that people have led their businesses. So how do you help companies get away from that? Cause it's a grind. It's an absolute rat race grind that diminishes your value and diminishes your profit. What, yeah. do, we, what do we do? Well, so everybody knows when their end of quarter is. If you've yes. got a calendar quarter or cal- you operate on a calendar year, it's likely that your customers know that. If your customers have worked with you for a number of years, it's likely they know that your what your quarter end is based on a fiscal year if you've got a fiscal year. It's also likely that they know what behavior to expect toward the end of the month, toward the end of the quarter, toward the end of the year. They're smart. They're observant. They're paying attention. You're not going to surprise them or shock them. So rather than manage based on these quarters. What happens if we actually back up a bit? And instead of thinking about end of Q2 in the context of end of Q2, we actually start planning for it and getting things prepared toward the end of Q1. So there's less urgency there that we're putting on our team and we can really focus on the value that we're delivering to an organization and set the right expectations. But if you become Kohl's and you've got a sale every other week, Expect your customers to not pay full price. Expect your customers to come in and ask for a discount. Expect your customers to do this because you've conditioned them to do it. They have professional buyers on the other side who are going to try to take advantage of whatever levers and dials they can work through. And your behavior throughout each of those pieces is an indicator of how you're likely going to behave in the future. So my guidance there is let's not start thinking about this stuff when we're in the moment. Let's think about a couple of minutes or a couple of minutes or a couple of days or a couple of hours or a couple of months earlier. I I had a conversation with someone recently. We're talking about 2024 planning and said, when do you typically do your planning for next year? Well, usually it's those last two weeks in December. I put this thing out there. 
why? Like there's Christmas and Thanksgiving and all of these holidays that are happening. What, ha- what would happen if we actually started 90 days earlier? We've already got the numbers. We kind of have an idea of where we're going to end. What if we actually started that planning process earlier? What position would that put us into? Could we be more proactive in the way that we're approaching things rather than reactive and then be late on comp plans, late on whatever it is that we're forecasting? So it's really, it's more of a shift in timing and starting to say, we know that these things are always going to happen. January 1st falls on January 1st every year. June 30th falls on June 30th every year. We can start looking at these things 30, 60, 90 days in advance and based on your the motion of your business. Now, if you're super transactional, it doesn't really make sense. If you've got really short sales cycles, then now your timelines are going to be a little bit more compressed. But if you've got those longer enterprise sales cycles, like, come on. I mean, if your sales cycle is 6 to 12 months, what makes you think that you're going to create urgency or do this thing in the last... A couple of hours or whatever. Like, who's going to win there? Yeah, I was talking to. Uh, I got. We all have buddies in the sales world, right? But one of them, one of them is a uh, specifically is working with with governments, and it's a yep. you know top Fortune Fortune one thousand business, and and we were just talking about essentially that, like the asinine nature of of expecting. That if you could come in, like you could browbeat somebody into getting more deals when if you're not getting a contract in front of somebody, you know, three months in advance, six months in advance, nine months in advance, understanding procurement cycles, understanding exactly when they're going to the city boards are going to vote on this type of stuff. So there's an unnecessary stress that's created on the sales organization that ultimately brings about maybe nothing or less revenue that is just it's inbred into uh to a company culture and so you when you start that like how do you get off the is it simply that point of okay we solve the problem we get off we we take a time out as a company we need to stop this rat race because again it you i could also look at the software industry where people are we have buyers trained on that right now like all the time they are just trained they wait like oh no yeah (laughs) And a quarter, I know, I know I'm going to get this discount. Oh man, there's going to be a price change. I can guarantee if they've introduced a price change, I'm going to wait until two weeks before the price change. And I'm going to get the, the deal of a lifetime. You know, those type of things. How do you say for a particular organization, time out? Not going to happen. Mike, so, Mike's here. Yeah, it's so hard. It's hard to get people to accept speed bumps, right? Like you, know, you think about speed bumps that you put in school zones to try to get things to slow down. So how do we get these speed bumps inside our organization where not only do we have the noise of what's happening in the day to day, but we've got the board, we've got investors, mm-hmm. we've got the market, we've got you know, wherever they are. Like there's all of this external pressure that's come that's coming around. So uh, the big part is getting everybody to just pause, take stock and say, okay, here's where we are. What? would happen if we decided that within the next six months, we wanted to completely shift the way that we're interacting with customers inside this operating environment. And we've got to deal with this six-month gap where it's going to be tough and things are going to change and we're going to be doing things on a day-in, day-out basis, but we're preparing for the future. We're actually thinking for the long term. And people really struggle with that. And they'll struggle with it from because of the way that our comp plans are designed. They'll struggle with it because of the way that pressure is going to come. They'll struggle with it for a number of ways. So one is trying to create that speed bump. And you can create the speed bump with with questions. The other one to think about, and it's really good to hear you you talk about government. Well, depending on what type of government you're working with, their fiscal year either ends in June and starts in July, state, local, or ends in September, starts in October, federal. That's been going on for a long period of time. We should be able to look at our data and understand the seasonality of our business that aligns with those things. And then we can work backward from those dates and say... If we're going to be in the budget for the next fiscal year, October 1st, when do those budgets get approved? When do they get finalized? When is the first rev or second rev? And let's work backward. Let's design backward from there and say, people, if you are not having that conversation with someone in a position, purchasing position inside that organization by April of a given year, 
the likelihood of that deal getting done in September or October is very, very small. So here's our window to make sure that we have those things in place. And again, just be very, you know, be a bit more strategic in the way that we manage our time, manage our activities to align with the way that the customer buys on their end. And if we're struggling with trying to figure that out, ask them. So when you buy something like this, typically when do you need to get it into the budget? What happens at the end of the year with budget? You know, we'll ask stupid questions like, do you have budget for this? I went through the process of in the, pro- mm-hmm. I'm in the process of buying something on behalf of a client and right now. Yeah. And that question has come up multiple times. I've told the rep, it's the wrong question. Don't ask it. Question still came up in the conversation with the client again. And I'm like, I, it just, it's, it's, it's coaching and it's, it's training that we give our reps and we tell them to go in and ask these things. And I would say, I would tell you this. If I've had a, and I grant I've been on the sales side for a long time. If I have a problem that I need to solve inside the business, I can figure out where to get the money. I can figure out how much revenue I need to generate in order to support it and when I need to be able to pay for it, or I know where to go get it inside the organization because it's sitting there. That the budget question is just stupid. It's too early, and, I get, and people get banted to death, which is ridiculous. Um, anyway, so that's that's how I that's how I look at those things. What are the compelling events? How do we yep. design around those compelling events, uh, and and kind of work through it that way? Another really cool one that people forget about: there are sometimes your management based objectives, your MBOs that people are accountable for, mm-hmm. fall outside of the traditional fiscal year. There's an expectation that they've set to somebody out there in the marketplace. So we're going to do X by Y. If your thing aligns with that X by Y, figure out what that date is and work backward and identify where the risk is associated with not getting X by Y. And then project manage your stuff. As a sales rep, there are four core skills. The ability to gather data, conduct research, ask effective questions. The ability to leverage story. Know who the characters are, know what transition they're working through, know how they're going to move through that, how they interact with others. Time management, stuff that we talked about a little bit earlier with the Eisenhower matrix and you know, doing the right things, knowing what to say no to. Project management, building your plan, calling people to action, holding them accountable. You do those four things, you will be the best sales professional inside your organization. And I don't care what your background is. I've seen it happen. I think we need to, we should probably lead with that. Uh out of the whole discussion, I think one of those things, those four things and the way you frame them, any salesperson listening to this, just so you're aware, hit Mike up and make sure that uh, you you are chatting with him, following him on LinkedIn, because he dives to the heart of the, the stuff with, and I, what I like about this, Mike, is you, you're putting it in a different lens. It is not the same four things that somebody else would tell you, <laughs> that somebody that loves Bant would tell you. Searching for a question a little bit, uh, I have it in my head, but it's it's really... How did you come to clarify? Like, it, it seems to be your personality to take things apart, rip it apart, understand, define it, and clarify it for yourself so then you can therefore clarify it to others. Is that my, my nailing you? Because that seems, seems to be it. I, I, uh, I just shared some origin story recently type stuff, but the, uh, and I, I got into this a bit deeper than I'll get into right now, but it's, it's the combination of growing up and, liking puzzles and playing video games and building with erector sets and Lincoln locks and Legos and doing that kind of work, then getting into electrical electronics and taking them apart. In fact, I used to make those cable boxes that uh, could get you certain things that you know, oh, really? the cable company didn't really like. I think the statute of limitations is far beyond and nobody could prove this, but yes. So, that, so doing that Dang. kind of stuff yeah. is really, is you, you, you learn that you really like to deconstruct things and put things back together. And the story I share there is I want it to look like the picture, but sometimes I have, I'm missing parts because there's parts behind it that aren't really necessary, especially when putting together like the internals of Legos and whatnot. I'm not a big instructions person. And the reason why I'm not a big instruction person is because I like to just kind of screw, you know, there's the dude who put the, uh, another X and Y axis, the, do you curse and swear on this? Show I've, you're 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 quite all right. Yeah. Fuck around and figure it out, right? That whole fuck around yeah. and figure it out. You, this is how you. If you fuck around, you start to figure out a lot of stuff. 
out. So let's go out there, fuck around and start figuring some things out and give people the freedom to go out and do it. But I think the challenge is not a lot of people feel comfortable with going out and doing it. They don't have that trust in self. They don't know where to start. So I want to help them build systems, frameworks, tools, process so that it helps to change their thinking around problem solving, decision making, goal setting and execution, achieving results and effective communication. This all comes from an, uh, that stuff as a kid and then an operations background, never wanting to get into sales. I did not want to get into sales. I had a bad relationship with people who were in the sales space. I saw them act differently in the house versus out of the house. And I thought everybody, everybody in that profession was just full of shit. So I didn't want to get there. So I went the operations route. Then I got into customer success before it was customer success, implementation success, helping people build and then saw really good sales pros work with customers and realized it was more about problem solving than it was pitching. I mm -hmm. think that's another big mistake we make out there. We pitch. And then led teams, realized the importance of specialization, and then got to the point where I could do this with other companies and launched Catalyst seven and a half years ago now. And it just, it's a, so it's a body of work. It's not something that just happened. But yeah, you know what? I like playing, I like puzzles, I like games. I like working with people. I want to help people be a better version of themselves and do that through systems and process and networking and connecting people. So that's the that's where all of this kind of comes from. I've had people tell me I color outside of the lines and I do. I like it just there's a different way to go about doing this stuff and not not everybody can think this way, which I get and I used to think everybody could. Like I used to think all of this stuff was just basic dot connecting. People could look at those pictures and see all of the things. I realize they don't, but there is a way to get there when you use tools and frameworks to help simplify this and actually get closer to achieving the results you want and getting those goals. So that's the that's the background, Paul. It's uh, I'm a very I'm a weird weird person. A lot of people would describe me that way. Wow, I love it. I love it. I, you got it. The best people I found in sales, and I, I take this as. Uh, there's not a whole lot of people that raise their hand and say sales is is the way to go, right? That's what I'm going to do. That's what I want to do. That's what I love to do. I've seen great examples in it, and I'm just going to go kick ass. Um, they come at it from all sorts of different directions, all flavors. Yeah. And then the best I talk with, and you're among the best I talk with, right? They they come to this idea of it's a it's a mixture of problem solving. I because I love that definition question. It's a mixture of problem solving. It's a mixture of people. People are messy, right? Yes. So it's it's how we communicate to the people, and it's a mixture of service and leadership. Like that's how I really have defined it in my head, which is you're putting those things all all together. And the amazing thing is, is that, and I'm I'm interested in your feedback on this. The amazing thing is the best people that I've ever talked to in sales they <laughs> commission breath is gone because they know that that's not. It's not even something to be considered when you're first going into a sale, right? There's no money without the service. There's no money without the leadership. There's no money without any of the, the pieces parts. So it just, it's gone. I don't know. That's, that's, it's a big deal in sales. And so how do you help people get rid of that? Get rid of that pitchiness, that schmarminess, that commission breath, the like that, that idea that sales is somehow a lesser profession because it's not. I think it's actually one of the most noble things when done right. The person who I think has said this best is Anthony Ian Arino. He said, sales is not something you do to someone. It's something you do for someone. I think he, he nailed that. And there's nothing that I could add to that or build upon to make that any better. If you take the perspective that perspective, then all of these other things start to come together. Now, functionally, the way that I do this inside organizations and how I help people and how I've done it inside my own business is first understand um, you know, what are our guiding principles? What are our core values? What are the things that we use in order to help inform decision-making in the field? For me, it's understand the customer better than they understand themselves. Deliver the solution in the context of what's important to the customer. Set expectations and execute flawlessly. Don't limit ourselves based on preconceived notions. So go in there with a bunch of assumptions. And don't make our problems the customer's problems. And that fifth one is the one is one that I've added 
in let's say the last couple of years, primarily because I've seen that thing happen over and over again, where it's, Hey, we really need to get this thing done. Can you go talk to this person about getting it done? Well, that's an internal problem. That's a lack of planning on our end. That's an issue that we created because we didn't manage internal expectations. So the, so those five guiding principles, if someone's out in the field doing work and they understood the customer better than they understand themselves, understood themselves, went through and did the research. They delivered the solution in the context of what was important to the customer, not what was important to us. They set expectations and executed flawlessly. They didn't limit themselves based on preconceived notions and they didn't make turn our problem into the customer problem. Then any decision that they made, even if it was the wrong decision or it didn't work out, I can feel really comfortable with the way that they made that decision. And that is how you create an opportunity for people to lead self in the field. And when you create the opportunity for people to lead self in the field, you don't have to micromanage your team and stifle your team. You actually have better conversations than pipeline review discussions around all the deals where when you're in that meeting, that meeting sucks the life out of me. And I'm waiting, I'm hoping that the person in front of me goes a little bit longer. So we run out of time and we don't have to do my pipeline review into the next time. Like these are all games <laughs> we're playing. We laugh about it because we know it, we see it and we feel it. So. Yeah, it's a it's a combination of understanding your guiding principles. It's a conversation. It's a it's designing for success, designing for customer journey. The you know, how you execute as a business, how you execute as a rep, putting the right systems and tools, your kind of utility belt together, uh, so that you can go out and do it. And when you do that stuff, then you've actually got something you can assess people against and determine is the challenge we're running into. And this comes from a UK study um, on behavior change. Is the challenge we're running into a capability challenge? So this is Com B, and it comes out of the UK. Is it a capability challenge, knowledge or skill? Do people know what to do? Can they do it? Is it an opportunity challenge, so culture or leadership? Have we created the right operating environment for people to be successful? Yes or no? Are we putting the right lead? Do we have the right leadership in place? Yes or no? Do we have the right systems in place? Yes or no? Capability, knowledge, skill, opportunity, leadership, culture. Motivation. Are they motivated? Are they internally motivated, externally motivated? Do we have the right incentives in place? All of those things. If you look at those, th your behavior change challenges through those three lenses, you could start to realize, okay, is my problem that people just don't know? Is it a capability challenge? Is it an opportunity challenge? Is it a motivation challenge? If you have one of those three challenges, then behavior change is going to be really, really, really hard. And that happens on both sides. So on the client side, we're talking about behavior change, they have knowledge, skill, opportunity, motivation. You know, like we can come through and we could start measuring against these tests, tests to determine and reduce the emotional side of this awesome game we play and be more logic driven, data driven in the way that we coach our teams, inform decisions, help our customers move things, move things forward. But uh, I and Reno nailed it with it with sales is not something that you do to someone. It's something you do for someone. The iteration on that, that I do when I start talks is I get in front of people and, I, and I'm fortunate to do this. I get in front of people. And the first question I ask, how many people like to be sold to? And this could be a room of a couple hundred people, thousand people. You get a couple of hands that go up. There's always some people who like it or they think that that's just part of the game. Like my brother yeah. likes going and negotiating at car dealerships for whatever reason. Like I, I, that's not what I, that's, that doesn't do it for me. <laughs> but it's how many people like to be sold to. And then the next question I ask is how many people like to buy things? And everybody laughs. They smile. And I say, look at that. We just had a state change, a catalyst. We talk about it in the context of we don't like to be sold to, but we like to buy things. Why is there this disconnect? Why is this challenge out there? And then how can we use that to help grow our business, help do better things for others, help make an impact? Because that's, that's what this is all about. It's making an impact. It's helping people solve problems. It's not about creating problems. It's helping people solve problems. Problem, enough problems exist. You don't need to go out there and create them. Let's solve the problems that exist and then move on to the next. Well, that, that takes us all the way back to the first question I asked you. Yeah. And uh, the first two, actually, with the energy and impact and the definition of sales is problem solving. So I, this has been an awesome journey. I've, I've loved it. The last one, I'm just going to make sure I have this down here. It's 
Com B, C O M B. C O M dash B. It comes out of the UK. Dash and B. I learned this back when I was the CRO over at Sci- uh, Chief Revenue Officer over at CybeSafe. Uh, mm-hmm. And this it informed what we were doing from a cybersecurity perspective and, and really on the behavioral sciences aspect of that. And it's phenomenal. It's given me a completely different perspective to think about coaching and the way that we look at behavior change um yeah. and how and and it's because it's super simple and it's three so like you know, anything in threes it's simple that's for me no that's why i love it but uh i i'm actually send me the study and i will actually i'll look it up i'll look it up but uh there's two two final questions i just want to make sure people know how to find you number okay. one because this has been a, a fantastic time and you've given some great ideas so how do they find you well, hopefully they're more than ideas. Like there's stuff that you can put into practice. You can put decisions that you're making inside your house tonight against one of these two by twos that we talked about. You can do that. If you're working on solving a problem, you can put it up against the hexagon and you can get, you could reduce risk by improving perspective. So you can do this. This is more than ideas. Ideas are crap. <laughs> execution is where this stuff happens. So get out there and execute. The best way to find me is go to findmycatalyst.com. And that's the name of the podcast that Paul was on before. Uh, if you go to findmycatalyst.com, you will see everything. And ideally, I've designed that website so you're able to navigate and convert in a way that makes sense for you. But go to findmycatalyst.com. That's the best way to, uh, to get a hold of me. Awesome. And any final words you want to... I think you just did it. But any final words you want to leave anybody with before, you take, before we close it out? Go out there and execute, like do the work. If, if there's so many people who sit here and listen to podcasts like this and think about all the work that they're going to do and have all these ideas and they maybe even have a note card with all the notes on it that they're going to go out there and, you know, now they're going to think about it. do, you know, channel your inner Yoda, you know, do or do not. There is no try. Like go out there and just do the work. And when you apply, if you apply any decision that you're working against, against the uh, two by two, and you're struggling with making a decision and you share that two by two with me, I am happy to help you. If you are working through a problem and you put it through the framework and you're getting stuck, send me a note. I am happy to help you because if you do the work once, you've demonstrated that you will do the work. For the 99% of you out there who won't do the work, I'm not for you. Thank you, Paul. Hell yes. I'm pumped. Everybody, I'm excited. Get out there, do the work, keep shining bright. Thank you so much for being on the show, Mike. And uh, with that, we'll sign off from the Art and Science of Complex Sales. See you all next time. Thank you so much for listening to the Art and Science of Complex Sales. This podcast is sponsored by Membrane and our partners from around the globe. Here at Membrane, we believe that B2B sales is at a crossroads. Due to decades of quantity-based prospecting, information overload, and really a shift towards efficiency over service and pitching over leadership in sales, customers are saying enough is enough. They're tuning out average performers and choosing to take most of the buying journey on their own. This results in up and down sales results, forecasts that are all over the place, and salespeople that are half committed due to the fact that they're having poor results and they have an inability to truly connect with customers. We believe the road successful companies are taking to combat this is threefold. Number one, training to create leaders and executives across all areas of the team with strong habits and sales methodologies that bring value. Number two, technology. Technology that focuses and helps a salesperson succeed and reinforces great habits rather than wasting their time on filling out fields for reporting or wasting their time on spamming customers that have no interest in ever buying. Third, talent. And I'm talking about talent that's empowered and emboldened to make a difference for their customers and their companies. So where are you on that journey? Membrane and our network of partners across the globe are here to help and to elevate the sales profession. We streamline critical technology by combining CRM, training and enablement, and more into one seamless platform. We drive best-in-class methodologies through our partners. They provide the top thought leadership methodologies and resources from across the globe. And our collective efforts are dedicated to recruiting, training, coaching, and empowering, and measuring the habits of the top teams in the world to ensure success. Join us at Membrane.com to learn more. And thank you so much for listening.